Throughout the movie, Bruce tells Dick that he can't kill Two-Face, that it will make revenge his entire life. By the way, if we're paralleling these two men, I can't help but wonder if Bruce is talking about the Joker here. After all, in the first film, he let Joker die. He tried to save him, but he couldn't keep a hold of his hand at the top of the tower and he let go. That's the man who killed his parents. So now that Jack Napier is dead, does Batman feel like vengeance has become his whole life? I don't know. I doubt that's what was intended, but it's interesting to think about because Bruce does seem to be speaking from experience. Anyway, Dick finally decides at the end not to kill Two-Face, and he actually saves him. Yet at the very end, when Two-Face dies, Dick has a look of real satisfaction on his face seeing him die. He wasn't directly the cause, much like Batman with the Joker, and so I guess that's actually kind of a neat parallel. But he does get what he wanted. It is revenge of a sort. He didn't kill Two-Face, but he got to be there. I wonder if it wouldn't have said more about Robin's character to keep Two-Face alive at the end, put him in Arkham so that Robin knows he's still alive but is satisfied with his choice not to take revenge and has therefore grown as a character. I think he really does grow as a character, don't get me wrong, but this strikes me as formula getting in the way of story. We've got two villains, they team up, and then at the end, one has to die and the other is kept alive. Happens that way in Returns and Batman and Robin, and even kinda in both Nolan films. I like how much Batman resists Robin as a partner. This is the whole reason he hasn't been brought in before now. Burton wanted to keep him solo, because it doesn't make a lot of sense for such a lone character to have a partner. I tend to agree with that, but it works pretty decently here because Bruce goes through a character arc. He resists Robin when he thinks he's obligated to be Batman because of his past, and at the end, after he's almost hung up the cape for good, he accepts Robin because he now chooses to be Batman. This wouldn't work great for the comics because it kind of puts a damper on the complexities of the character, but I think it works fine here as long as this is the end of a trilogy. It works great as long as there isn't another movie in this particular franchise. Oh, crap. This certainly isn't a deep film, but I'm happy that there's something in there to think about. The villains themselves don't make us think. Two-Face is just an insane killer, and Riddler's riddles are child's play. I wish they had been harder so that when Batman solved them, I could think Batman was really clever for figuring it out. Once again, as is always the problem in these movies, Batman isn't really a, d a detective. I can't complain about the Riddler beyond that very much, though. Jim Carrey is channeling Frank Gorshin, who's one of my favorite actors. He played the Riddler in the 60s show, and although that was campy, I always thought that version of the Riddler could work in something serious. Yes, he has a lot of one-liners and his schemes are over the top, but he's an over-the-top kind of villain. There are a lot of places where Jim Carrey is just being Jim Carrey. He's got lines like, caffeine will kill ya, and like the jacket, it keeps me warm when I'm jogging at night. These aren't really things the Riddler would say so much as the kind of lines that wind up in a Jim Carrey movie in the mid-90s. They sound like things The Mask would say. And of course, they're there to get Jim Carrey fans into the theater, and I think he did have a lot to do with why the movie was successful. Luckily, he's playing the one villain that it kind of works with. I also love his hideout really looks like the kind of place a demented stalker writing riddles to his idol would live in. I like how he's inspired to become the Riddler with this creepy fortune teller thing. And his motivations are clear and don't all have to do with killing the superhero, like Two-Face. He has an invention that beams TV signals into the brain, but Bruce won't sign off on it, so he takes matters into his own hands. He's played up as being disturbed and very reclusive as it is, so it's not a stretch that it doesn't take much to send him over the edge so that he kills his boss and becomes a supervillain. Surprisingly, I actually kind of buy this. Then he builds his company, sells his invention, and makes a fortune, so we don't have to wonder where the elaborate lair and gadgets at the, at the end come from. I don't entirely understand why he needs Two-Face to steal for him, since he's making so much money on his own, but at least he doesn't ha suddenly have a bunch of henchmen out of nowhere like Two-Face does. Although, it would make more sense in Riddler's case, he probably has enough money to hire anybody he wants. It's mentioned that nearly everyone owns one of his boxes, so he's probably going to hit Bill Gates rich pretty fast. And I like that he doesn't have a vendetta against Batman until he finds out that Batman is Bruce Wayne, who he does hate. And I like that he finds this out by tricking Bruce into using the box. Oh, and we see Two-Face on the box more than once, and we're told that if you put it on while other people are using the box, you get their brainwaves. So why doesn't it make Two-Face smarter? One of the best ideas in the movie is bringing in a psychologist, because it's trying to explore Batman's psyche. If there has to be a love interest, this is a great idea. The problem with Chase is that she seems more interested in getting into bed with Batman than she is in his psyche. How can someone this unprofessional get into such an esteemed profession? Schumacher has a really hard time coming up with ways to get her and Batman on screen together. She uses the bat signal to contact him, just so she can flaunt herself on him. I can't believe the police are so incompetent that it's that easy to get to the bat signal. Wait. Okay, never mind. I can believe it. 
Chase and Bruce really do have some chemistry, and a lot more than Bruce had with Vicki Vale or with Catwoman. I just wish she had been made into a more believable character and less flaunty. This doesn't feel like a sequel to the first two to me. It's officially part of the same canon, but no one's worried about continuity here. Batman killed people before, and he doesn't here. Gotham looks entirely different. He seems to have completely rebuilt the Batcave, the car, the costume, everything. Harvey Dent seems to have contracted Michael Jackson syndrome. The things that are the same are the actors who play Alfred and Gordon, and that's about it. Having said that, I'm not really complaining. I like Val Kilmer in this role, and I care a lot more about Batman now, especially when he's... Uh, when Val Kilmer is playing Bruce Wayne, he seems more in control in the role than Keaton did. Although there are awkward moments where Kilmer doesn't seem to like the dialogue he's given. That's fair. This is a more complicated Batman, but he's got one-liners like, Chicks love the car, and that doesn't really work. Frankly, Returns didn't have a lot to do with the first film either, so this isn't such a problem for me. Here's a few amusing nitpicks. Bruce Wayne knocks down the door to Chase's office when he thinks she's in trouble, only to find that she's making so much noise because she's using a punching bag. But they're in police headquarters. Why draw attention to himself like that? Why not just get a couple of cops? Why does the Batmobile come out of the floor during an intruder alert? <laughs> intruder alert! Here's the car so you can vandalize and or try to steal it. Why is Batman sitting in a courtroom in full uniform just before Harvey Dent becomes Two-Face? When Riddler's tower zaps the Batwing, what is he shooting it with? Brainwaves? It really is a good thing the Batmobile's grappling hook sunk in at just the right spot on the roof when it drives up the side of a building. It would be really embarrassing for Batman if it snapped and the car went sliding back down. That's just a Rorschach inkblot chase? Really? Bruce is just seeing a bat because that's what he wants to see? Because I think even Rorschach from Watchmen would say... Herm, that's a bat. Why does the Dream Doll look like Two-Face? Two-Face has been trying to kill Batman this whole movie. Now he has Bruce, knows it's Batman, and he's lying on the floor with a concussion. He doesn't kill him because Riddler says, if you kill him, he won't learn nothing. Why does Two-Face go along with this? Why not just kill him there? And what does Riddler mean by this? Why does he have him go through death trap after death trap and then do the sadistic choice thing at the end where he has to choose between Chase and Robin? What is he supposed to learn by this? And were those death traps just there to make the movie more fun to watch? He couldn't have meant to actually kill Batman with any of them since he's got this whole elaborate trap at the end. So why does the whole third act feel like a video game? Why is there a dog on the box? Why does this lady at Wayne's factory have purple hair? Is that up to dress code there? I give Batman Forever a 2.5 out of 4. It's got a lot of good ideas, really well paced, and a lot of fun stylistically. And yes, I really don't mind the neon. But Two-Face is a letdown, and the subplot linking Batman and Robin's grief really doesn't pay off like it should. Next time I'll be tackling X-Men 3. See you then.